Coming up in the next hour, as Apple urges the Trump administration to not proceed with the next round of tariffs on China imports, the founder of the company's largest supplier urges the iPhone maker to consider Taiwan. Plus, Slack Day 2 shares fell at the close, but so far the direct listing is being hailed as a success all round. Will it become more of the norm? And three Oracle women are looking to bust the class ceiling. They claim the company pays men more than women for the same work and want their lawsuit to be granted class action status. But first to our top story. Well, billionaire Terry Guo may no longer be the chair of Apple's largest supplier, but that isn't stopping him from trying to keep that relationship going for years to come. Guo has stepped down from that role at Foxconn to focus on his campaign to become president of Taiwan, and he seems to want to make sure that tensions between the U.S. and China don't force Apple to leave the country. Speaking from the perspective of the Republic of China, I will plead to Apple to come to Taiwan. This news comes after a Nikkei report that Apple asked its larger suppliers to think about shifting production from China to Southeast Asia. To discuss, in Minneapolis, we've got Loop Part Ventures partner Gene Munster and in L.A., uh, Bloomberg Tech's resident Apple watcher Mark Gurman. So there's some confusion about what Terry Guo actually said here. He made some remarks. An assistant later clarified them, Mark. What exactly did he say and what did he mean? Right, so I think the context here is very important, right? I think this might be getting a little blown out of proportion because this is the guy who is in charge of Foxconn, helped create Foxconn uh, for many years. And of course, Foxconn is where Apple produces pretty much all of its iPhones outside of India uh, right now out of China. And now he stepped down to run for president of Taiwan. Wouldn't it benefit him greatly if Apple moved some of his production from China to Taiwan? Wouldn't he look really good as president? Wouldn't it be a really good campaign slogan for him to say he's trying to get the iPhone to move from Foxconn to Taiwan? So I think people have to understand what's going on here. There's the political side for him. There's a political side for Apple. So he has a lot to gain by making this happen. Gene, bigger picture, all of this is based on a report from the Nikkei a couple of days ago that Apple asked many of its China-based suppliers, and Foxconn is a Taiwanese company but manufactures iPhones in China, asked these China-based suppliers to consider moving production outside of China, perhaps to Southeast Asia. Do you think that would ever happen? And what are your broader thoughts on the implications of Apple even considering this at this point? Emily, I think that that uh, very well will happen in time. And I, I point back to four years ago when Apple started to consider doing production with Foxconn outside, actually in Brazil, because of some of the tax laws, the import laws in Brazil. And so I think that uh, this motivation for Apple to essentially de-risk themselves with China, I think, is nothing new. The timing on it is suspicious, and probably the truth is several layers uh, beneath the surface about why Apple's talking about that now. But I do believe that outside of all the things that are going on with trade, Apple has a long-standing interest in diversifying outside of China for the manufacturing. Now, Mark, without getting too deep into Taiwanese politics, uh, Terry Guo has pitched himself as a China first candidate. This doesn't sound very China first, but you know, what are the sort of broader political implications here of Apple moving, considering moving its, its, its factories outside of China anywhere and, and perhaps even to Taiwan? Yeah, you know, this could be seen a little bit as a lose-lose situation for Apple. I mean, you've seen the struggles that Apple's competitors, such as Google and others, have had in China. Apple is the rare major U.S. or non-Chinese tech company to actually be mostly free to function in China. Most of their services work there. They have dozens of retail stores across the region. They've had a lot of success there revenue-wise in the last, you know, five to seven years or so as well. That can't be said for Google and others. So if Apple starts stripping out parts of production from China, that's going to cost a lot of jobs. Apple's responsible for about 3.5 million supply chain jobs in China alone. If those jobs start going away, it's going to hurt the Chinese economy. And China is going to have less of a will to want to work with Apple to keep them in their stature in the region right now.
Meantime, Jean, <clears throat> you've got a new note just out on Apple's reputation in China. What have you found? So, Emily, we've been monitoring this closely since really May 5th when the trade dispute with China started to flare up and then with Huawei, too. And what we wanted to get a sense was with what the typical Chinese consumer, if they'd be boycotting Apple products and try to get a read, too, on what the government is thinking. And as we've gone back uh, over the past month and looked at social media within China and also the broader China news media outlets, the Reddit of China, all of those have a surprisingly supportive tone relative to Apple. Uh, and the reason why I think that this is important is that the tone in the media is directed from the top. It comes from the government. There is no question about that. And I think that there is an insight in terms of how China uh, wants to operate and work with Apple potentially or potentially do some tariffs against them. And I think if you uh, take in this very clear view that, uh, in fact, the government is putting a positive narrative out related to Apple, I think that's a sign that the government wants to continue to work. Exactly like Mark said, three and a half million supply chain jobs. They don't want to disrupt that. So I think that that is uh, a positive for Apple. I just want to briefly mention, too, is that with the typical consumer, even though on social media they're speaking relatively positive or are overwhelmingly positive about Apple, that doesn't mean that the typical consumer feels that way. Uh, there could still be an impact of a negative iPhone number in China based on some of the things that are going on in the geopolitical world. Meantime, Mark, want to get your thoughts on another story. Google announcing that it's getting out of the tablet business. This after it just released a new Pixel tablet. What do you make of this announcement? Not entirely surprising. I mean, what you've seen since Google really entered the hardware business in a big way in 2016 is that from a market standpoint, from a revenue standpoint, their hardware has been a flop across the board. The Pixel phones are some of the best Android phones on the market, some of the best high-end phones on the market, but they just do not sell anywhere near the quantity of Samsung or Apple to a point where it's hard to believe that they're even close to profitable on this hardware business. So what you're seeing is one sign now of them sort of winding down their hardware business. Now, I'm not saying that's gonna happen completely, but tablets, if you look at the categories of major consumer electronics devices. You have smartwatches, you have TV devices, you have tablets, you have smartphones. And, you know, taking one of those products off of the shelf is a considerable deal. And I think it's a sign of more things to come if they don't turn that business uh, up a notch pretty soon. Interesting. I know you'll continue to follow that one for us. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you so much. Gene Munster of Loop Ventures, you're sticking with me. We're going to be talking about Slack later. Now, speaking of U.S.-China tensions, five more Chinese companies are joining Huawei in being banned from buying U.S. products. The U.S. Commerce Department raised national security concerns over the company's role in China's efforts to develop supercomputers. Among those added to this blacklist, the Chinese joint venture partner of the chipmaker AMD. Meantime, later Friday, Huawei filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Commerce. The caption of the court docket indicates the company is also suing the Bureau of Industry and Security and the Office of Export Enforcement. Huawei doesn't seek damages and is looking to recover equipment seized by the United States. Coming up, is the party still going for Slack? We'll look at the second day in the public eye for Stuart Butterfield and Co. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Slack's been a public company for two whole days now, and since its direct listing Thursday, shares jump well above their reference price, but close slightly below their opening price today. It wasn't the flashiest debut, but that's what Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield said he wanted to minimize volatility. So is the idea of forgoing an IPO in favor of a direct listing going to catch on? Colin Stewart of Morgan Stanley thinks next year there could be as many as five direct offerings and for them that could be a good thing since only Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and Allen & Co have had lead roles on high profile Silicon Valley direct listings like Slack and Spotify. That means fewer banks to share the pot with. To discuss Slack day two and the future of tech companies going public still with us Gene Munster of Loop Ventures and in studio who else but Bloomberg Tech's Ellen Hewitt who's been covering Slack for us and to be clear there wasn't a pop on the first day. The opening price 
was the opening price, that's right? right? Yes, that's totally right. Everyone is looking at the $26 reference price and calculating the closing day and, and looking at a you know 48% pop. That's not right. It opened at 3850. Mm -hmm. That's really the price we should be looking at and comparing performance to. 20, the reference price, no one was buying or selling at that price. No one was agreeing ahead of time to buy at that price. That was just something the New York Stock Exchange put out as a guide. Yet, folks are still looking at this as positive momentum for Slack. Jean, how optimistic are you about Slack's future growth? I mean, I'm most optimistic, in part is because of this concept of future of work. And they've been zeroing in on this communication piece, and really that's the substance of why they've gone public. But they have an opportunity to extend that beyond communication into workflow in terms of kind of uh, using AI to give recommendations to people about how to use their day nudges. Humans instinctively uh, become distracted and get off task and they can uh, really evolve their platform to helping some of the efficiencies of work. And so the point is simple, is that there is growth opportunities, new markets uh, that uh, Slack can pursue. And I think that will be good for the stock longer term. Now, in a way, there's an irony about Slack where it's called the email killer, but in a way you're also more connected to work if you use Slack and you use Slack religiously, Ellen. Who wants more nudges, as, as, as Jean said? And it, if the goal is to sort of minimize nudges, minimize your, uh, or, you know, sort of improve or change your connectedness to work, but you're only then working more, is Slack really doing its job? I think that might end up being a central question that we ask ourselves about Slack for the next few years. You know, I asked a question on Twitter the other day about how people relate to Slack and how it compares to email. And I got a lot of interesting responses where people are just sharing how, you know, it's, it's tough. It's like the more people use Slack, the more it becomes the place where everyone is just asking you to do stuff. And people were saying, you know, it's like email and, and in some ways it's better, but in some ways it's worse because the barrier to entry to writing a Slack message is a lot lower than it would be to writing an email. And so, and it is this expectation of being something you should respond to instantly. And so people are having, I think, uh, an evolving relationship with whether Slack is actually helping them be more productive or less. My sense is, honestly, people who use Slack in a smart way are probably getting more done. People who are just using it to chat are maybe not. And so I feel like it falls on Slack to make sure that it's easy for users to understand how to use it in a really effective way. And that would probably require a lot more education on their part or really smart design so that someone who just starts using Slack isn't going to get caught up in instant messages and seven different channels and, and feel overwhelmed. Interesting. So, Gene, do you think direct listings are going to become more of the norm? Because to be fair, they didn't actually have a pop, but they did get to take home any difference between 26 and 38 50 because they didn't open at 26. They opened at 3850. Yeah, undoubtedly, I think this is the future. I come from a background uh, in investment banking and, and can think of that as an area that is, is, uh, is ripe for disruption. There has been a decade of talk around uh, direct listings and that has really never played out. The last big one was Spotify almost two years ago. So uh, what's the, the message here is that this is a better instrument, a better vehicle for uh, becoming public because it achieves two things. One is better tr price transparency, which investors want, and separately is lower fees, which companies want. Because of that, I think that this is an undeniable trend. There are such large forces in place uh, around the IPO process that it will take, in my opinion, a decade before we see half of the companies uh, doing direct listings. But this is only going to increase. Right. You know, it's hard to say this is a trend. We saw one last year, one so far this year. We spoke with Byron Dieter, partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, who thinks that like you, Gene, this should become more of a trend. Take a listen to what he told us. Very few companies uh, have attempted this, and it's a small class of companies that can pull it off in the current construct, but I think it suggests very good things for trying to do more of a market match for these IPOs as opposed to the pops that have happened uh, for the other companies that won public this quarter. So Ellen, how are banks adapting to this what could become a trend but isn't quite a trend yet? <laughs> They're preparing. They're definitely looking at this idea and the way that it's catching on and the way we're, we're all talking about it and thinking, okay, 
if we're not going to be getting the same underwriting fees, how can we set ourselves in a good position to be advising these hot companies before, during, and after a direct listing? And so that, you know, you're seeing them be more involved ahead of time and, and after maybe trying to advise these companies on M&A and other credit facilities. But most importantly, during the direct listing, they're coming up with new ways to get fees. So Morgan Stanley, for example, is now the advisor to the direct market maker, Citadel Securities. That's not really a role that Morgan Stanley was focused on playing in the past, but I think they're looking at that as an important role for a bank to play if direct listings become more common. Jean, how do you imagine this changing, uh, you know, the amount of, let's say, M&A that happens, changing the dynamic between the banks, changing, you know, potentially the balance of power between banks and the companies they work with? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, for the banks, they will uh, slowly, again, it will take a decade, but they're going to slowly lose some, at least, the the, uh, the economic interest in this. And, well, they can come up with new vehicles, and they are, to help continuing to get some fees from this. If you look at it as a whole, kind of that 7 percent, which was the golden number as the percentage of an IPO that would go to the investment banks, uh, that, that pool is going to be declining over time. I suspect that it will be a slow decline, uh, but undoubtedly it will decline. And so... Uh, how I see this playing out on M&A in particular probably doesn't have as much of an impact on M&A, but definitely on the, the listing side, uh, this is going to cause uh, a lot for investment banks to think about. This is not new to investment banks, of course, because they've already gone through this exercise when it comes to their trading platforms, having decimalization and also uh, automated trading, which has impacted some of those fees. All right, Gene Munster, Loop Ventures, always good to have you here on the show. Ellen Hewitt, thank you for your tireless and continuing coverage of Slack. Just a reminder, Bloomberg Beta, the venture capital arm of Bloomberg LP, is an investor in Slack. Coming up, Oracle is being accused of underpaying thousands of women. We will give you the latest in a gender pay suit seeking class action status next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Women at Oracle are trying to break another kind of ceiling, the class ceiling. Three female staffers are trying to obtain class action status for their lawsuit against Oracle over pay discrimination. The women want to represent more than 4,000 employees on the basis that the database giant pays men more than women to do the same jobs, which would violate the California Equal Pay Act. But winning class action status won't be easy. In the last two years, two similar gender pay suits against Microsoft and Twitter failed to advance as class actions. Joining us to discuss is the Alt Schuler Burson partner, Jim Feinberg, who is representing the women. In this case, you were in court this morning. What happened? This morning, the court uh, continued our hearing on our motion for class certification until September 9th. The motion is fully briefed but a lot of evidence has been submitted, so the court wants more time to read the expert reports and the declarations. So what makes you think that this suit has potentially more merit than the Microsoft or, or the Twitter lawsuits or has a better chance of getting class action status than those? This is a particularly strong case, both on the facts and the law. Uh, our expert from the University of California has done a report saying that looking at the women in the product development, information technology, and support job functions, and controlling for the same job code, and even controlling for education and experience. On average, those women receive $13,000 less in compensation per year. The uh, Microsoft case and the Twitter case are distinguished both factually and legally. Those cases both involved individual manager discretion. In this case, Oracle had a policy and practice of using prior pay to set initial pay at Oracle. And Professor Newmark's statistical analysis shows that that gender gap from prior pay led to a gender gap in starting pay at Oracle that continued throughout their careers at Oracle. Right, and certainly if that is how pay is determined, that is nowadays a big no-no. That said, 
Oracle, we did reach out to them for a statement. They say, this meritless lawsuit is based on false allegations and a seriously flawed process within the OFCCP that relies on cherry pick statistics rather than reality. We fiercely disagree with the spurious claims and will continue in the process to prove them false. We're in compliance with our regulatory obligations, committed to equality, and proud of our employees. What's your response to that? I'm glad that they're proud of their employees, but they should pay their female employees equally to the men employees for the same work. They highlight the fact that the U.S. government, the OFCCP, has also brought a suit against them. That case will be going to trial in December of this year. Our case is completely independent of the OSCCP case. We received Oracle's payroll data. We had an independent expert uh, review that data. Our expert and the, and the government's expert have reached very similar conclusions having uh, reviewed the data. These are not uh, fake facts. We'll find out more in September. Right, as you mentioned, the Department of Labor has a, a similar case that was brought during the Obama administration against Oracle about pay discrimination. They filed a similar case against Google for gender pay discrimination. They've since dropped that case. And historically, these cases are very hard to win, in part because of a ruling that the Supreme Court made in 2011 involving one and a half million Walmart female workers. That ruling that the Supreme Court made in 2011 influenced the Microsoft and Twitter decision. Can you get around that, that ruling, or could that ruling also stand in the way of your case? The Dukes versus Walmart case that you're referring to uh, was not brought under the Equal Pay Act. It was brought under Title VII. And in that case, which involved thousands of Walmart stores, the Supreme Court said that the decisions were made by individual managers at an individual level, and that because it was individual discretion, you couldn't have a class action. Here, in contrast, we have the Equal Pay Act, and the standard under the California Equal Pay Act is that it's the employer's obligation to pay women who are doing the same work as men the same compensation. Here, Oracle isn't doing that. The cause of that disparity doesn't matter. Oracle had an obligation to ensure people doing the same work were paid the same, and they didn't meet that obligation. We have a second claim under uh, the California Business and Professions Code, which is based on this disparate impact from using prior pay. And that is a common pattern and practice, and therefore class certification is appropriate in our case in contrast to Duke's. Interesting. Well, we'll be following your progress. You'll be back in court in September, and we will be watching uh, Jim Feinberg representing the plaintiffs in this case against Oracle. Thank you. Thank you. All right, coming up, he's one of the biggest names in tech design. We're going to talk to John Maida about why he's now leaving Silicon Valley behind. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. As one of the biggest names in tech design, John Maida was the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, became the design partner at the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins, and has authored several books on the subject. But he's now decided to leave the world of Silicon Valley in, and instead compete with it head on. Maida recently became the chief experience officer at the ad firm Publicis Sapient to help legacy companies compete with tech giants, and he joins us now here in the studio. So you're still working on some Silicon Valley oh, projects. Well, I'm still at Automatic Leading Design there, but I'll transition in August to Publicis Sapient. This is certainly a step out the door. Of all the jobs that you could have had, uh, why do you want to now um, help legacy companies compete well, with Silicon Valley? Well, I have my, I love startups, but I also love end-ups, the companies that have ended up successful and are losing to startups. And I think as startups and big tech sort of like control the world, uh, a little competition wouldn't hurt. What's your take on the tech lash, the sort of wave of anti-tech companies? I mean, all the way up to the, the U.S. government happening right now. I think it's completely natural because if you're here in Silicon Valley, everyone understands computation, the cloud, the invisible world. But people outside it, they don't understand it, so they're afraid of it. Here in Silicon Valley, we're afraid of it because we know what it can do. 
outside of Silicon Valley, people are afraid because they're not sure what it is. Mm. So do you think that legacy companies stand a chance of competing with big tech at this point? I mean, it certainly seems like Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they've consolidated so much power. They've got a lot of money, and they've got a lot of smart people, even if they make some mistakes. Um, I think they can. That's why I want to go this direction, um, because uh, the legacy companies, established companies, are all good at IRL. Mm -hmm. They're all good at real life. They're good at spaces. And we're human beings. We live in three space, not just on our screens. Mm -hmm. And this isn't enough. There's mm -hmm. something missing in it. It's also a bit addictive and bad. Really? So a <laughs> little bit. Um, so this world of the established companies working in real space, there's a competency here that has to mix with the virtual. So I want to see this competency get better inject computation, Silicon Valley practices, and maybe there's going to be a way where Silicon Valley can learn, Silicon Valley, can, Silicon Valley startups can learn from end-ups. So what particular things were you fed up with, with Silicon Valley? Oh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I was fed up. I'm more like there's so much knowledge here and capability here that the rest of the world hasn't caught up yet mm -hmm. because here we speak machine. Mm -hmm. Outside, people don't speak machine, mm -hmm. and they have biases against it without actually understanding it. So that imbalance is the problem right now. You're actually coming out with a book later this year called How to Speak Machine. What do you mean by that? Um, I think here everyone understands like how, how code works, how the network works. I call this kind of like Spanish 4 level competency. But most people don't speak the Spanish of computation. They don't code. They don't sit around and Wi-Fi all the time. So they can't actually speak machine. So How to Speak Machine is like Spanish 1 for understanding the cloud. So, you know, last time we had you on, I believe, was some Apple announcement. And yeah. I love hearing your thoughts on, on, on Apple design. I know you follow the smartphone industry. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot going on now with the US-China trade war, Huawei versus Apple. Huawei is now being put at a disadvantage selling out to global markets outside of China. Apple at a disadvantage selling into China. Do you think these macroeconomic issues will seriously change the hierarchy of the smartphone industry? Well, um, I think, first of all, we have to recognize that the car industry faced the same problem in the 1950s when cars were a commodity. And they had to differentiate based upon experience. So Apple took advantage of that same moment where smartphones became ubiquitous, commoditized, and they differentiate an experience. Um, the Chinese are really good at design. They're really good at experience. And they've built amazing systems. And so I think the danger of this separation is to underestimate that the Chinese designers are actually quite good, if not better, than a lot of things that Apple does right now. Like at what? Um, uh, most of the stuff comes from there. So eventually they're going to learn how to make it themselves. Does this mean you think like Apple could become the next Ford or, or, or GM? I know those companies are, are, are working on being more tech savvy, but... It may be, it may be the Porsche. Um, <laughs> if you think about it, though, um, Apple's biggest challenger is Google, I think, hmm. because of the way they've combined hardware and software together with Ivy Ross leading hardware. She's the real Johnny Ive, I believe, of the Valley. Really? Okay, that, now that's a controversial statement. Oh, look statement. out. Look out, look out, look out. <laughs> Ivy Ross. Ivy Ross. Okay. Oh, my gosh, yes. She's amazing. Okay, but Google's phones, and we were just talking about this earlier, they've discontinued you know, getting out of tablets. The Pixel sure. hasn't done that well. Oh, the, but the Pixel's an amazing device. Uh, I have both. I have mm -hmm. the X and, and the Pixel, and the Pixel just has better software. And so at some point, it isn't about the hardware. It's about the engine. Think about the Prius. We like it because of the hybrid engine. So that's a t type of technology. Apple's technology and software has lagged Google's, te Google's technology. Now that said, there's an interesting wrinkle in the, in the Huawei story in that Google can't now update its Android operating system for Huawei. Huawei could now be forced essentially to build its own operating system. How big a threat is that to Google and Apple and the two dominant mobile operating systems. Oh, I think like gigantic beyond belief mm. because I think here in uh, US or Europe, we underestimate what's happening in China. Uh, China is the Wakanda of payment tech, <laughs> right? We're like, what are you, you're still doing that? We, we do everything with mobile. So if that happens, the difference is going to only increase. Should we be concerned about national security issues? I think we should always be concerned about national security issues, but we should also be concerned that the experience quality in China is improving on all fronts. And it'd be great to learn from them, partner with them. Now, if you think someone at Google is the real Johnny Ive, does that mean you think Apple isn't innovating as much as it has in the past? I mean, what is your, if, 
What, what, what grade would you give the pace of innovation at Apple today? Oh, I would give it a B. And this is coming from an Apple fanboy. I had the original Apple II, the original Macintosh, the first iPhone. I have all the devices. Um, but competing now isn't just about the hardware awesomeness. It's about the software awesomeness. You don't think Apple software has an awesomeness? I think it's awesome, but I definitely, I definitely can see that Google software is so much better. Huh. Because it's, uh, Google has mastered the cloud. So Apple is, ab is about to unveil in September, we believe, a new round of phones. We have reported they'll be fairly incremental in terms yeah. of design changes. Mm -hmm. What does Apple need to do to, to kickstart innovation or get back to an A from well, John Maida? Well, I would, I would also say that Apple's an A in privacy. Hmm. And that, when we say about Apple's design, we're looking at the fancy graphics and aluminum, whatever. I'd argue that the new aluminum of the Apple phones is the privacy features. So that's also another thing we shouldn't overlook. So I think Apple might win the people who care about privacy. Hmm. Uh, Google may win those who care about convenience more. So let's we'll see what happens. All right, fascinating stuff. John, good to have you back here on the show. John Mado now at Publicity Sapient, Sapient Chief Experience Officer. We'll see if you can help those legacy companies change up big tech. Thank you. Coming up, the tech IPO phenomenon continues as tech cannabis company Akerna hits the NASDAQ. What the CEO had to say about legalization. Next, this is Bloomberg. This week, New York lawmakers failed to agree on how to legalize marijuana, dealing a setback to Governor Andrew Cuomo's progressive agenda. Advocates said Cuomo and the state's legislature didn't appreciate the law's criminal justice consequences and didn't push enough for legalization. The news comes the same week as the cannabis tech company Akerna hits the public market. Akerna is a regulatory compliance tech company in the cannabis space led by Jessica Bingsley, Billingsley. She is the first female CEO to bring a cannabis company to the NASDAQ. I spoke with her earlier and asked, what's unique about taking a company public when it's not working on things that are always legal? Take a listen. Well, I think the right way to think about us is actually as a technology company that happens to serve the cannabis industry. So we are we are a software as a service business uh, whose client base is um, participates in arguably one of the fastest growing industries in the world. So what is unique about taking a tech company that serves the cannabis industry public? There's just a bit more scrutiny for any company that is working and interacting with something that still has a federal state conflict here in the United States. And, and we certainly spent more time walking through how we enable regulatory compliance and our role, which is really to serve as the backbone to the cannabis industry, enabling compliance, enabling regulation, and enabling taxation. Now, you're one of the earliest investors in the cannabis industry. You're based in Colorado where marijuana has been legalized. What do you think of how the cannabis industry is taking shape? It's really exciting to be part of an industry that is, that is being shaped with regulation from the ground up. And if you look at this through the lens of seed to sale tracking, which we invented, and you think about the level of transparency and accountability that we have in cannabis, that has applications to any agricultural product, really to anything that we put on or in our bodies. So for instance, if you remember the romaine lettuce scare that we had uh, a couple months ago, where nobody knew where the contaminated romaine lettuce was, if that were cannabis, we would have been able to tell you where every package of lettuce was and if it had been sold on what day, at what location, at what time, and, and if it was medical to what person. So legalization recently stalled in New York, in New Jersey. Do you expect other East Coast states to get involved in the debate? I think it's a matter of time. It's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we do believe that we'll see movement again in, in both New Jersey and New York. I personally predict that, that New Jersey will probably edge out New York in terms of being the, the first to legalize here, well, not the first to legalize in the Mid-Atlantic, but the, the first of um, this highly concentrated metropolitan area to legalize. What about on the federal level? Do you expect the situation there to change? 
I do. At some point in time, the federal-state conflict needs to end in some way. So currently, 33, I think is the number, out of, uh, out of our states have legalized, so that it's overwhelmingly a majority. They've legalized cannabis in some capacity. And we do have a couple pending bills that could substantially change the, the federal-state conflict, in particular at the States Act, which President Trump has publicly said that he would support. If we were to see that pass, that would give the states the ability to legalize and, and regulate cannabis, and, and we think that's, that's likely sometime in the next year. That was a Kerner CEO, Jessica Billingsley. Well, autonomous cars are only as good as the human drivers they learn from. So the people who teach these systems need to be excellent drivers themselves. Bloomberg Tech's Aki Ito recently joined two vehicle operators who work for self-driving car startup Aurora on a test drive in the chaos of downtown San Francisco. Every year, more than a million people in the world die in road traffic accidents. And many of those fatalities are caused by us, by the mistakes we make as drivers. But there's a solution. Okay, we're ready. Okay, engaging. And it's to relinquish control of the wheel to a computer. We've dreamed about it for decades. And now we finally have the technology to get us very close. The rest is up to these two. They're teaching autonomous cars how to drive. My name is Daniela Landi. My name is Stephen Lin. And we're autonomous vehicle operators. Daniela and Stephen work for a startup called Aurora. And they're part of a team of about two dozen specialists who drive the company's fleet of self-driving cars on the roads of Pittsburgh, Palo Alto, and here in San Francisco. Aurora's software learns from their expert example. So to get this job, they had to be excellent drivers to start with. I went to go see Daniela and Steven at their office in San Francisco. Founded in 2017 by engineers from the early autonomous vehicle projects at Google, Tesla, and Uber, Aurora is developing technology to power self-driving cars. And so far, it's signed deals with automakers including Volkswagen and Hyundai. Daniela and Steven have invited me here to be the very first reporter to sit in the back of one of their self-driving cars. It says ready up here. Ready? We are ready. Okay, we're engaging. Now we're in auto. <gasps> Whoa. Yep. Tracking the car ahead, stopping. So the car right now is stopping on its own. It's stopping on its own, it's thinking, it's making decisions. This is really cool, getting to see what the car sees. Yeah. What are these yellow boxes? Uh, the yellow boxes right there is, that is a That's bicyclist. That's a cyclist. Oh, so cool. It's, so the car recognizes that this is a bicyclist. And if you see these kind of blue boxes, that means the vehicle recognizes it as a vehicle. And the red boxes are pedestrians? Pedestrians, exactly. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> Aurora's operators take turns as pilots and co-pilots of the cars. Today, Daniela is a pilot. I'm looking at everything, I'm thinking about everything, planning for everything. If the car decides to bail out in the middle of the intersection, what am I gonna do? See how her hands are ever so slightly touching the wheel, her foot hovering just above the brake? She's ready to take over in a fraction of a second whenever she or the car senses she needs to. And that's her bailout. Oh. And I took over. The car saw something that was not accurate and it gives me control. As Daniela's co-pilot today, Steven's job is to keep an eye on his laptop that shows what the car sees. Getting a false positive on the left, flickering. 
He alerts Daniela to the things she might not see with the naked eye and prepares her for what the self-driving system is about to do next. It's gonna want a left lane change. Okay. As the co-pilot, Steven is also taking notes on when Daniela needs to intervene. Later on, the engineers will pour over this data so they can figure out what went wrong. This is all part of the painstaking process of teaching a computer how to drive. It's a brain. It's a little baby brain that learns. That you're uh, nurturing step mm -hmm. by step. Yeah, I call all of them my baby robots. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. <laughs> because we're teaching them. That was Bloomberg Tech's Aki Ito. Still ahead, Silicon Valley may have some new competition, how one company is bringing tech to California cities like Fresno and Bakersfield. Next, this is Bloomberg. In 2013, Bitwise Industries launched with the mission of bringing tech to the agricultural city of Fresno, California. Since then, the startup has launched a coding school, repurposed 250,000 square feet of real estate for tech tenants, and produced more than 1,000 new software developers. Now it wants to support other underdog cities. The company announced it's raised $27 million in its first big funding round with plans to expand to Bakersfield and other cities where opportunities in tech are lacking. Joining us to discuss, Bitwise Industry CEO and co-founder, Irma Ogwin Jr. Irma, thank you so much for joining us. For having me. So to be honest, I had no idea that you were doing this kind of work in Fresno. When we talk of, you know, underdog cities, we talk about Austin, we talk <laughs> about Detroit, um, but really there are so many cities out there that, that could have something to gain from this. You do a lot of different things. You've got a coding school, GeekWise Academy, you're doing commercial real estate. Talk to me about how this all fits together. Yeah, sure. So we think that the solution for innovation and really staffing the next generation of the technology workforce is going to be found in places like Fresno and Bakersfield. They're underdog cities, and they're all over the United States. So sure, we teach people to code, but with an emphasis on how do you reach the people who haven't previously been invited to this segment of the economy. So entering into the technology industry, then we give them a sense of place so they don't feel inferior in the places in which they live, actualize the, actualizes the experience of being a technologist, and then we prove it with the work that we do by shipping world-class software from these places. What kind of students are these? I mean, are these college students? Are these mid-career? Yeah, generally they, they are non-matriculating non students, so uh, maybe retail workers. Some of them, like myself, have come from the fields of California and other cities. Um, so these are the folks who um, definitely have something to offer the technology industry or, uh, when they're given the chance to do so, but maybe haven't been given that chance. Tell me how you found this your story yeah I think fields. I think that a lot of what bitwise does and is 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 best understood through the lens of my life I sort of accidentally ended up as the CEO of a technology company that's raised a bunch of money that's and no growing. accident don't so be modest it's a lot of hard work too but it's really a lot of things that had to line up just perfectly to make that work and so when you kind of reflect on that you think it doesn't have to be so accidental we can be more deliberate about the opportunities we put in front of young people that can change their lives. So you're going to use this money to expand. What are the other cities that you would consider truly underdog cities? Yeah, we've sort of loosely defined what we think an under underdog city looks like. Bakersfield is the first one that we have landed on to expand to, sort of prove that out. Um, but there are other places you might think of throughout the United States, places like El Paso, Milwaukee, Tucson, uh, places where you would find a density of person that would su support the technology industry and where that opportunity would have a huge impact on the local economy. So what's the success rate of the students that you have taught? I mean, where are they going to work? Are they, you know, a potential new source of talent for big tech companies, if yeah. that's the goal? Yeah, so 80% of the students who enter into, er, enter into our career programs earn technology employment, uh, which it has a huge impact on the local economy. 90% of those students want to stay where they live, right? They want to stay home. That doesn't mean that there isn't opportunity for big tech to start to swoop them up, especially if you have this lens of diversity and inclusion. That's where you're going to find these people. These people are going to come out of underdog cities. They're going to assist in sort of making the diverse and inclusive technology workforce that's sort of missing out in these other 
other primary markets. So how diverse is this crop of students? We're talking about 50% female, 50% minority, 20% first generation. The demographics of our students that enter into the technology workforce match the demographics of our county. As it should be. Uh, so how quickly do you think you can expand? I mean, I imagine you're based in Fresno, you gotta come to Silicon Valley, you gotta go to New York to raise money. That's not easy in a place where, you know, well, it's this hard raise. for people to raise yeah. money who don't look typical. That's exactly right. It was, it was a long road, um, but we did close a $27 million Series A, which is a huge milestone for us, for females, for the technology industry as a whole. That money is going to help us grow faster, and then we'll see what's next. So how do you imagine, let's say, you know, I think there is so much focus on metropolitan areas, but how do you imagine the tech industry might or will look different in, let's say, a decade as a result of what you are doing, as a result of this new sort of movement. Yeah, I think what's important to recognize is that we have all of these currently unfilled jobs in the technology industry, and we're not graduating enough CS ma majors to fill them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to come from somewhere else. Where are people looking right now? We think we have the solution to that, and we think we can change the face of that workforce in the next five to ten years. All right, fascinating. Really glad to hear about the work you're doing. Bitwise CEO and co-founder Irma Ogwin Jr., thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live on Twitter. Check us out there at Technology. It's Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. We will be back here on Monday.